Well, thank you, Jonathan, and uh, many thanks to the um, organizers for inviting me to be part of this um, wonderful and delicious and fun um, conference. First of all, an apology about um, a slightly mangled uh, title that got onto the program. My fault entirely. I was vacillating. Um, would I talk about domestic devotion? Would I talk about miracles? And somehow two different titles got spliced. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> in the end, I decided to focus on domestic devotion. But rest assured, for those of you who are interested in miracles, there will be plenty of those um, too. An earthquake rips through an Italian town. Devastating cracks appear in the buildings. Walls start to collapse. Terrified people scream from windows while their homes crumble. Others try to attract attention by standing on rooftops and waving their hands, but to no avail. Just one house withstands the tremors, and the reason for this is clear. Inside, a family consisting of mother, father, and four children all neatly attired and tranquil, are on their knees, praying intently. Their intercessions are addressed to a tonsured saint who hovers close to the house, almost within touching distance, and yet separated by a ring of clouds that signals his supernatural locale. The culmination of the act of domestic devotion is materialized in the image itself, an ex voto commissioned by a family from Viadana in Lombardy to give thanks for the salvation of their home. Now, in some respects, this is early modern Catholic piety as we would expect to find it. The image comes from the large collection of painted votive tablets at the Basilica of St. Nicholas in Tolentino in the Marche. Each image painted on a wooden block and left at the shrine records and gives thanks for a miracle granted by the local saint, an Augustinian friar who died in 1305 and whose canonization trial was already up and running 20 years later. Prayer is seen to be directly efficacious, thanks to the intercessory power of the saints. But in other respects, there is something confounding about this image. The prominent depiction of the nuclear family, disclosed by the unusual cross-sectional view into the house, does not conform to stereotypes of Catholic devotion in Renaissance Italy. In fact, on first seeing this image, I was reminded above all of English church monuments that represent the pious Protestant family. This one is a lovely example from the Church of St. John the Baptist, Madder Market, Norwich, that commemorates the family of a local lawyer and mayor who died in 1600. So let me begin by investigating that somewhat skewed reaction a little further. Why, when I see an image of an Italian Catholic family experiencing a miracle, do I think of English Protestant tombs? Since the Reformation, we have been encouraged to view Northern Protestantism as firmly rooted in the home and family. And here's an assortment of images of pious Protestant families at prayer, saying grace, surrounded by biblical inscriptions, giving thanks to God for their, uh, for their dinner. When we imagine Catholic lay devotion, we're more likely to picture something like this, in which the Venetian uh, confraternity of San Giovanni Evangelista is securely positioned within the institutional structures of the church. The reason for this representational divergence is perhaps obvious. The Reformation was born of anti-clericalism and disenchantment with the institutions of the Catholic Church. The doctrine of the priesthood of all believers insisted on the direct relationship between the laity and the divinity. Protestants of all descriptions were invested in household piety in a way that was less pressing for the Catholic devout. The spiritualization of the household, a phrase coined by the English historian Christopher Hill in the 1960s, has long been entrenched within the historiography of early modern Protestantism. Historians of um, Germany, for example, Lyndall Roper or Stephen Osmond, have been particularly influential in arguing for the relocation of religion within the Protestant household. Meanwhile, interest in domestic devotion continues to grow, especially in early modern British context. 
I'm thinking particularly of the pioneering research of Tara Hamling on Protestant interior decoration, and Alec Ryrie's wonderful work on prayer with his emphasis on doing religion, doing that was often done at home. For all this recent interest in the practice of religion in the home, the role of domestic devotion in the southern heartlands of Catholicism, non-persecuted, non-controversial, conservative, orthodox and indigenous, remains elusive. And it's the desire to illuminate household religion, both before and during the, the age of Catholic reform, that motivates our European Research Council um, funded collaborative uh, project, Domestic Devotions, the Place of Piety in the Italian Renaissance Home. And here we all are having a nice time um, in Tolentino in the Marche. In embarking upon this subject, we've inherited a rich body of scholarship on the Italian Renaissance Home, ranging from the demographic research of historians like Christian Clapis Zuba and David Herlihy to more recent studies of material culture, such as Patricia Fortini-Brown and Isabella Palombo-Fossati on Venetian households, and the exemplary catalogue edited by Marta Aymar and Flora Dennis at home in Renaissance Italy. And yet, with a very few exceptions, historians of Renaissance Italy have said little about devotion in the Catholic home. Of course, it's not that Italian Renaissance historians aren't interested in religion. I scarcely have to tell uh, you guys that. But for the most part, our instinct is to seek devotion in churches, institutions, and civic rituals. And there's a practical reason for this, which is the sources. Looking back at this painting of Piazza San Marco in Venice, I know that I could head off to the archives and find out about the institutions that are represented here. The ecclesiastical archives, uh, well, actually, they're about to move house, but th at the moment, they're just behind St. Mark's, and they'd have plenty to tell me about the basilica, as well as the religious orders involved in the procession. Or I could go to the other side of town, to the state archives, and ask to see the records of the Scuola Grande of um, San Giovanni Evangelista, the confraternity that commissioned this painting. But alas, what I can't do is go into the archives and ask to see the records on domestic devotion. In tackling these problems, our research team is adopting a very open and multidisciplinary approach. And in the remainder of this paper, let me give you a taste of the ways in which we are attempting to investigate Catholic piety in the home by focusing on one aspect, the experience of miracles. So I'm going to talk about two types of sources, pictorial ex votos of the kind that I showed you at the very start of the paper. These images, presented at shrines in order to give thanks for miracles, proliferated from the 1490s. About 1,500 of them, dating from the 15th or 16th centuries, survive at shrines um, across Italy. And here is where some of the, the larger um, early modern collections are today. But we can be sure that thousands more have perished. On the other hand, we have the textual equivalent of the pictorial ex votos, printed compilations of miracles, which poured off the presses from the 1470s, usually produced by the clergy or religious orders who were responsible for a shrine in order to promote and publicize the cult. They were probably bought both by locals and visiting pilgrims, reading matter for Sabrina Corbellini's vernacular literate laity. These sources, visual and textual, cover a great variety of miracles occurring in different locales. So here's a taster. There are accidents, for example, people falling out of trees or falling into barrels. What a way to go. Um, injuries sustained by adults um, or by um, children. This uh, little boy badly injured by a ferocious pair of scissors. There are instances of violence, especially among enemies, nemici, and there are miscarriages of um, justice righted through the intervention of the saints. Uh, so here, for example, uh, a nice ex voto from Lonigo of a, a prisoner escaping through the roof while the Madonna uh, looks on um, approvingly. 
Whether or not these calamities occurred within the walls of a home, and we can't always know, their ramifications would certainly have been keenly felt within the household. Turning to the printed records of Renaissance miracles, house and family are undoubtedly key. Indeed, reading a miracle book like that of the blessed Giovanni Buono of Mantua, published in Bergamo in 1590, can make one quite paranoid about the dangers of domestic life. In one chapter, we read of how um, the wet nurse of a baby girl called Maria allowed the child to tumble into the fire. In another, how Anya Zina, the daughter of a baker from Verona, went blind when she tripped up and fell. And another tells of a woman who slipped and broke all her bones when she was doing the laundry. Meanwhile, Luca Farini, official chronicler of the Shrine of the Santissima Annunziata in Florence, told stories about local children falling off roofs. And uh, my favorite, I think, a little boy who got stuck in the latrine. This is a genre that specializes in dramatizing the everyday. While the boy in the latrine is an unambiguous case of a domestic miracle, I want to reiterate that looking for domestic devotion will often take us outside the physical space of the home. The girl who tripped up and damaged her eyes was probably playing in the street or the piazza. The woman who slept while washing clothes had gone down to the communal laundry. The Florentine girl who fell from a roof had, Farini tells us, been sitting up there in the sun bleaching her hair. And this experience of mobility is important to our emerging sense of Catholic domestic devotion. Particularly revealing in this respect is a story from a compilation of Miracles of the Virgin Mary, published in 1551. Chapter 35 told of a boy who was brought up in a pious household in Lombardy and who was taught by his mother that whenever he passed the painting of the Madonna that hung in a quiet corner of his home, he should hail the Holy Mother. Ave Maria. One day the boy was out with his friends playing by the river and he fell in. Everyone assumed that he had drowned, but he was later discovered safe and sound, standing on a small rock in the middle of the river. He told his mother, it was the Madonna from our home who rescued me. And he led his mother back to the house to show her the painting. On account of which, most dear brothers, when we see the image of the Mother of Christ, we should hail her humbly and with devotion and reverence kneel down before her, so commented the author of this tale. At one level, this story of the Virgin in the home is straightforwardly didactic. The anonymous author sought to encourage families to practice their devotions piously in their homes. At the start of the 15th century, the Dominican Giovanni Dominici wrote of the importance of placing images of young saints and virgins around the house so that the baby, even when still in swaddling clothes, might be surrounded by positive examples. In Italian cities, artists' workshops churned out small devotional images, like this one by Bellini, for domestic display. Indeed, Evidence from Venetian inventories suggests that the majority of households owned a devotional painting or other kind of image. And some, like uh, this one of Benedetto Franceschi, suggest that he owned um, multiple images. I don't know if you, you can see there, but um, un quadro de nostra donna, un quadro de passion, un quadro de Cristo con la croce, San Sebastian, etc., etc. Per esempio, But what's so valuable about the uh, account of the child's miracle is that it goes beyond prescription and approved practice to eliminate, to, sorry, to illuminate how lay Catholics might perceive and interact with a figure of the Virgin in their home. In this case, the critical interaction takes place outside the walls of the house. The Madonna travels with the child in his imagination and reappears in a moment of crisis when he is about to be swept away by the river. Moving from images within the home to images of the home, how is domestic space imagined in pictorial ex votos? First of all, the number one site of uh, miracles is the bedroom. Here are just a few um, examples, one from Lonigo in the Veneto from 1500. 
a nice one from uh, Tolentino, slightly later, parents kneeling beside their sick child's bed, uh, an inscription which uh, you know, gives you the identity of the parents and the child and a family crest. One from the Madonna dell'Arco outside um, Naples from the end of the 16th century, a bit more clutter um, uh, by this point. But in these late 16th century um, ex votos, the emphasis is still on the bed and on the members of the family who are praying to the Virgin on behalf of um, the sick man in this case. To give you a sense of the popularity of these bedroom images, at Tolentino, where the curators count 134 tablets from before 1600, uh, 54 of these, 40%, include beds, not including cribs. At Madonna dell'Arco, 330 out of 689 uh, 16th century tablets depict beds, so almost 50% of these Neapolitan ex votos focus on the bedroom. It's harder to identify other interior spaces in the home. Images of the kitchen don't come until much later. Hearths are rare, although this one, dated 1569, caught my eye. However, there are images of people experiencing miracles outside their homes. For example, this couple giving thanks for the salvation of their newborn daughter, who's just fallen down a perilous set of steps. And then there are moments of intercession outside the home, such as this rather beautiful image of a family gathering in prayer in the evening light, or a mother with her baby um, outside with a crib. In a hot climate, home life often occurs outdoors, but there's also a sense in which the exterior seems to bring the family closer to the source of supernatural power. And that perception is amplified by images which deliberately allude to the porosity of the home, where the walls open up to allow the supernatural to enter, such as this uh, miracle of um, a woman with uh, breast cancer, where um, the outside is, is clearly um, you know, coming, coming in. Or uh, this one, or even more uh, markedly um, where the crucifixion is the background to the bedroom. Or even where the boundaries between the home and church completely break down, such as this extraordinary um, image from uh, the Neapolitan shrine of the Madonna dell'Arco, where the bed has actually arrived at the shrine. Let's now return to the site, which on the evidence of ex photos was the epicenter of devotion in the bedroom in the home, the bedroom or the camera da letto. What can these images with their matchbox perspective tell us about domestic devotion? Even in a relatively simple image such as this one from Viterbo, the impressive bed with its elaborate drapes commands our attention. And of course it's unsurprising that bedrooms should feature conspicuously in miracles of healing since they were the stage set for sickness. Furthermore, in the dreamy state of sleep or fever, one might be expected to be especially receptive to intense spiritual experiences. This is the state in which St. Ursula has her famous dream, as depicted in this, the most celebrated image of a Renaissance bedchamber. On the right, we see the um, angel telling the sleeping saint of her imminent martyrdom. It's also clear that the bedroom is a space of particular significance in the life cycle, a place associated with birth, marriage, reproduction, maternity, and death. It could be a holy space, but it was also a morally and physically risky space, a place of anxiety, of bad dreams, restless nights, uncontrolled lusts, sickness, sin, and danger. It's curious that what you don't find in these um, ex voto images um, is religious paintings on the wall. Uh, and this contrasts with that fantastic um, image that Jane Tyler showed us uh, yesterday of uh, the prayers of Sarah, where there's that kind of disproportionately large Madonna um, on the wall. Contemporary inventory suggests that in reality, the Camera del Letto was a favored space for the display of devotional images. But in these simple uh, representations, the, the emphasis is on the actual apparition of the Virgin or Saint and not on their painted um, representations. 
If it's rare for painted X photos to show images, they do include some of the more portable props that would have assisted Renaissance Italians in their private devotions. Occasionally, a woman may be seen kneeling with a crucifix um, in her hands, but by far and away, the most common devotional um, accessory in these images is the rosary. Uh, so this one with this <laughs> amazingly elaborate, uh, massive rosary, which is um, binding these uh, three women, uh, comes again from the shrine of Madonna dell'Arco um, in Naples. Uh, where 35% uh, of the um, painted X photos include a rosary. Robbing and counting the beads in repetitive prayer assisted the devotee in, remo in removing him or herself from mundanities. The rosary, worn on the body and carried around by its owner, was not a static prop, a permanent fixture of the home, but rather, in the words of contemporary inventories, a bene mobile, a movable good, which provided a means of sacralizing the space around the devotee at home and beyond. Three thoughts by way of conclusion. First of all, what's Renaissance about Renaissance religions? I think that by focusing on the culture of the miraculous, I've opened a small window onto what we might term the non-canonical Renaissance, a world of cheap art and popular print fueled by religious sentiments. We need to be reminded that the creativity associated with the term Renaissance was often harnessed to devotional ends, as is clear in the extraordinary array of paintings, writings, and material objects that were produced to serve the needs of lay piety. Secondly, I began this talk with some reflections on the Protestant historiography, and in particular the role of the domestic in propping up the ideology of the Reformation. But the home was obviously also a crucial site of Catholic renewal, and Catholic reformers both before and after Luther could not possibly afford to let it go. I don't want to engage in what the medievalist John Arnold wittily refers to as earlier than Taoism, but it seems important to explore and flesh out the particularities of Catholic devotion in the home. And it's interesting that the sources I've been looking at are quite as much about inspiring domestic piety as they are about regulating it. As I see it, these textual and visual sources are above all supplying lay Catholics with a repertoire of stories which draw on the experiences of everyday life so as to fuel the imagination and hence the devotion of the people. Thirdly, as the historian of English Protestantism, Alec Rari, has commented, Historians readily divide piety into public and private, but this neglects the crucial, fertile, common ground of the household. I would endorse that view. The evidence I've discussed today points strongly towards a more dynamic vision of the home, which is in constant interaction with individuals and institutions. As my first slide made graphically clear, the home was not conceived as a bounded space of devotion, but rather one which could op open up to let in the supernatural. The porosity was two-way. Families drew on the power of local shrines and miraculous images. And when they experienced a household miracle, they made a pilgrimage to church and left devotive offering as a public commemoration of the grace received. Furthermore, I'd like to adopt a conception of domestic devotion that goes beyond religious practices that take place within the physical space of the home. The second definition of domestic in the OED places intimate and familiar alongside at home. For the Tudor linguist, John Florio, the verb domesticare meant to tame, reclaim, make familiar, mild, or gentle. It's clear enough that the Catholic Church was committed to taming and reclaiming the home as a site of devotion. As for the laity undergoing the crises of daily life, they sought a kind of religion that was familiar, mild, and gentle, attuned to their concerns. Thank you. <laughs>